Good morning to all of y'all. Such a privilege to be here with you, to worship the Lord together, the one who causes the rain to fall and the sun to come out. It's an awesome, awesome thing to worship our God. Let's sing together. I was buried beneath my shame. be seated please good morning church family it's great to see you here today as we worship the Lord and celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ the fact of what God has done for us in Christ 
knowing that we were once in bondage, we were in darkness, and God has rescued us and now placed us into a different kingdom, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of freedom, that we can enjoy a life in Christ. And listen, to live life the way God intended us to live and empower us to live that way. We'll learn more about what that means in a few moments. But we're so glad that you're here to worship the Lord with us, especially those who are guests. I'm sure there are several here visiting because of the holiday weekend, and we welcome you. We ask that you take a card in the seat in front of you, if you'll fill that out, and place that in the offering plate later in the service as your gift to us this morning. We'd appreciate you doing that. And all of us can use that same card to write down a prayer request. We'll have men collect those in a moment. Uh, We have men in the prayer room praying right now. And uh, they'll pray over those cards, and then Tuesday I'll pray over those as well. Also, obviously, with it being Memorial Day weekend, we want to take a moment and just thank the Lord for the freedom that we enjoy as a nation to do what we're doing right now. Men and women have given their lives, not just with time of service, but in in death, sacrificing their own life that we can uh, freely worship the Lord. Our founding fathers established the nation because... Uh, Christians were being persecuted in Europe and they came here and they set it up so that a man, a woman, boy or girl could not only express their faith in worship, in a place of worship, but to live out their faith uh, as, as we're created to do. And so we're able to do that here because men and women have given their lives to protect that freedom. Uh, my dad's uncle, when he uh, was in France, In 1944, he landed, and eight days later, he gave his life uh, for service of our country. And so I want to pause, and uh, he's just representing one of many. And I'm going to have a moment of prayer, thanking God for our nation and for uh, the freedom that we enjoy based on those who've given their life. But I want to ask, if you've had a loved one who's died in service to our country, would you mind standing, and let's have a word of prayer in honor of these as well as all those, all right? Others? All right, first service, we had many who had loved ones who who gave their lives. Let's pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you. God, we could have been born in a faraway place where you're not allowed to do what we're doing today. We could have been born in a place where we would never hear the gospel, uh, where... uh, where you you not only are persecuted, but you die because of faith in Jesus Christ. I thank you for men and women who gave their lives, who are giving their lives even now, to protect the freedoms that we enjoy, one of those being the freedom to worship you. And Lord, I pray that we'll not take that for granted, that we'll be mindful of this Memorial Day weekend of those who have done that for us. But more importantly, Father, I thank you for the one, your son, Jesus Christ, who died on our behalf to purchase our freedom so that we are no longer in bondage to a tyrant who is Satan, but we are now free in Christ. And Lord, I pray that we'll live in that freedom and we'll learn even today how how to do that. So we pray, Father, that you'll bless this nation that you will give wisdom to those who lead us. Father, that they will turn to you and those who have spiritual influence in their lives, that they'll listen to them. And Father, that they'll do the right thing to continue to secure the freedoms that we enjoy. So we thank you, Lord, for this brief moment to recognize what you have done for us. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all stand now and let's greet those who are near us, especially our guests. Hey, everybody, good morning. Glad you could join us. Here's what's going on at Linwood. It's that time of year again when Linwood is looking for volunteers for VBS. 
VBS is a great time for you to get involved, even if you've never done it. Maybe this is the year that you say yes to Vacation Bible School. VBS is a worthwhile and wonderful thing because you can use your talents and gifts to make a difference in kids' lives. If you think you might be interested in helping touch the lives of children this summer, we urge you to jump on linwoodbc.org and register as a volunteer. You won't regret it. The 2018 Honduras Mission Team is collecting donations out in the foyer today and next week. They're accepting items such as mild bar soap, baby shampoo, baby toys, baby blankets. The items are to be, to be delivered this October, but they will be collecting again in September. If you haven't downloaded the Linwood app, you should, you really should. It's, it's a one-stop shop for all things Linwood. Meet the staff, listen to audio and video past services, check the church calendar, see what's on the Wednesday night supper menu, make online donations, all from the palm of your hand. Go to the app store, search for Linwood Baptist Church and download it for free. Remember, there are no evening services tonight due to Memorial Day holiday. Enjoy your barbecue. As always, for more information on these announcements and much more, log on to linwoodbc.org or try the app. And if you're a guest with us this morning, be sure to stop by the guest services desk out in the foyer for your free gift. And welcome to Linwood. Let's all stand together. Let's give them our hearts. Sing this out with this heart. With this heart. It will be my joy to say your way. 
perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to Father, because you are good. You are the definition of good, perfect in all of your ways, even in our sin and in our brokenness, Lord. You still love us. You still welcome us with open arms. We thank you for that, Lord. Thank you so much. You may be seated. You know, um, my, uh, my little daughter is going to be three here soon, and she's doing new things all the time. And uh, one of the things she's doing lately is um, whenever she thinks it's appropriate, mommy and daddy haven't hugged each other or been really friendly to one another or whatever, she says, happy birthday, daddy, happy birthday, mommy. And that means that whatever we're doing, whatever we're doing, we have to go stop and we have to go give each other a hug. <laughs> and be friendly to one another and just show affection. And uh, we did that one time and now she's doing it all the time. So even if I'm grouchy or I just woke up, she'll notice and she'll be in her high chair eating something and my, and my wife will be cooking or something and, and she'll say, happy birthday, mommy, happy birthday, daddy. And we have to get up and go <laughs> give each other a hug. And uh, we're singing this song, Good, Good Father, and God is, he's a good father, amen. He's perfect and he loves us. But sometimes we're not always the best brothers and sisters to one another. I know I'm not saying anything surprising there. Um, we just aren't, we're imperfect. We're not perfect like he is. Uh, but this song that we're getting ready to sing is my way of saying happy birthday to you guys <laughs> and saying let's try to be good brothers and sisters to one another, amen. Let's do our best. It's not always easy, but here at Linwood it's about as easy as you're gonna get because everybody here is amazing and I love you guys. So. Uh, this song is for you. Happy birthday, okay? <laughs>
And brother, let me be on board you. When the night Ooh. will drive it all, be the one to light the way. Bring your heart on. Father, how we praise you for the help and the comfort that we get from one another. To know that your spirit works through others to encourage us, to help us in our time of need. Father, I pray that you'll help us learn that from your word this morning. Thank you that you've provided that for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for how you've prepared my heart for this morning, what you've taught me already. And Lord, I pray that you'll speak to us, open our hearts and our minds to your truth, that we'll respond by faith and obedience. And God, now I pray that your will will simply be done, and that we will glorify you as we study your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In a Peanuts cartoon, Lucy walks into the house and Linus is watching TV and she walks over and she grabs the remote and she changes the channel and he looks at her you know what gives you the right to do that just walk in here and change channels and she said well if you don't like it you're gonna face my fist and she said with these fingers individually they can do nothing but when I curl my fingers and I make a fist it is a weapon to behold. And he said, what channel do you want it on? And he turns around and he's starting to walk out of the house and he looks at his hand and he says, why can't you guys get organized like that? Now I think it's a great illustration of, of the church. And why it is is that so many churches can't get organized into a unit. And how does that happen? And, and what happens when that happens? When the church is united and the body of Christ is united, how do we get all the parts together, the fingers united in accomplishing a common purpose and a common goal? And that's what Paul is going to help us understand is the joy of unity, the joy that comes from uh, people who are like-minded are together. And I'll explain a little bit later how that plays out into everyday life. But the point is, is that he's talking to a church, this letter is written to a church in Philippi, where they are experiencing unity, there's great joy, Paul affirms that, uh, he's experienced that himself from them, but he's, he's making them aware of the threat of division in the church, of how that can happen. Now, if you stop and look at church history, and even contemporarily look at it, you find that most churches really don't divide or have conflict over doctrine or particular practices of their faith. That can happen, and sometimes that should happen. There should be a, a moment where you have to address a doctrinal issue. It, it's a test of faith. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, sometimes there are divisions among you, and he says they're good because the truth is tested. 
Somebody has to be right when it concerns a doctrine or a practice that is unbiblical. You have to address that issue. But if you'll find most churches, they have their problems over preferences, over interpretations of, 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 of what ought to be happening in a church. And that's true in all of life, isn't it? Most of our conflicts are over the preferences that we enjoy. 1999 in Landover, Maryland, Holy Creek Baptist Church, true story. The church split. It was in conflict, and the church split. Not into two, but into four. The pastor was in conflict with the staff. The staff was in conflict with the pastor. And members of the church were in conflict with each other and with the staff. And so what they decided to do, they had an outside pastor come in and arbitrate the conflict. And so what they chose to do is they had a pastor who, who preached a particular service. Those who were like-minded went to that service. They had four pastors. And so they had four services on Sunday morning, and you went to the church of your preference. Now, what in the world would divide a church over that? Was it doctrine? Absolutely not. You know what it was? Where the piano bench sat on the platform... Now, this is 1999, not 1950. 1999, they split into four services, four really different churches, because they had a bench that sat behind the Steinway piano. That church had existed for over 100 years. True story. Now, what do they divide over? Their preference. All right? And so they're not unified. They're not together. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is going to teach us about the joy of unity. And here's what he's going to say. He's going to help us see that there is something that will inspire us toward unity. Something's going to motivate us toward unity. Several things. The inspiration for unity. Secondly, he, he's, he's, he's going to help us see the indicators of unity. How do I know that I'm, I'm one with someone or in the body of Christ? How do we know that our church is unified? If I ask you that question... How would you answer that question? Man on the street interview. How do I know that Linwood Baptist Church is unified? Then he's going to show if a church is not unified, if people are not unified, here's the instruction toward unity, toward harmony. All right? It's a great passage of Scripture as he leads into one of the greatest passages of all of Scripture, beginning in verse 5. So let's go to Philippians chapter 2. I'm only going to deal with the first four verses. For those who are guests, we're going through the book of Philippians. And here's the theme of the book of Philippians. How to keep going with passion and joy. How to keep going in your faith. How to keep going when it's, all, when it's tough and everything's against you. You're discouraged. You want to quit. You want to give up. You don't understand what God's doing. How do you keep going? How do you persevere? But to do it with joy. The theme of this over our church, one word, is joy. But really it's in the context of suffering, of endurance. And how do we do that? How do we go? So he's going to talk to a church. How do you keep going? And how do, how do you have the joy of unity in a church? Here's what he says. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one's goal. Do nothing, on one goal, excuse me, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility. Consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So Paul gives this clarity to this formula for unity. Now what's the formula? Here it is. This is the sermon in a nutshell. Humility plus service equals unity. If you listen to the words that I just read, you'll, you'll, you'll pick that out. Humility plus service equals unity. When I humble myself, when I care about others and I'm serving others, it's going to create unity. Pride plus self-centeredness equals disunity. You look at a church that's unified, why are they unified? They're unified for one reason. It, it, the people are humbled before God. They're serving others, and they get it. Now, once you establish the vision, that's the formula. You've got to remember the vision that God has given us is the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the Great Commission. 
And uh, that's our focus. So once that's established, then how do we make it happen? And he explains that and brings clarity to it. First of all, I want you to notice the inspiration for unity. What should motivate me and motivate you to pursue unity in the church? Notice verse 1, he begins by saying, if, if there is any encouragement, if any consolation, if any fellowship, if any affection. Now, it sounds like he's uh, stating something as he's doubtful that these things are operating in the church. He, he, he makes it sound that, that I, I'm questioning whether or not this is really going on. Well, this is not a statement of doubt. It's a statement of fact. In fact, there are four facts that he's giving. There are four ways in which you ought to be motivated. And he's, he's really having you look back. Here in this first section, what should inspire you is not what's going on between the people. It's between them and God. You look back and you see what God has already done in your life. If these things have happened in your life, that ought to motivate you and inspire you to pursue unity. And so let's look at that. What is he saying uh, with these four facts? Notice these four statements introduce the command in verse 2, which he says, fulfill my joy or complete my joy. Make it complete. All right, so what are these facts that create unity and inspire us? Number one is God's encouragement. Verse 1, if or since there is any encouragement in Christ. This word encouragement is the same word that Jesus used in defining the Holy Spirit. It's the word paraclete. Jesus said that he's going to leave and there's going to be someone who's going to come to them and he's going to walk alongside of them and he is your helper. He is your comforter. And that's what he means by that. Well, Paul says Jesus is just like that. Jesus is our paraclete. Jesus walks beside us. And he is the one who gives us encouragement. That began when he saved us. That began when he allowed us to begin a relationship with God through the work of Christ on the cross. And so it means that somebody has come alongside of us and has given encouragement, has given counsel, has given exhortation. And that encouragement of Christ, that work of Christ in your life and in my life ought to inspire us to, to move toward unity. Christ has done that in my life. He's done that in your life. And so that helps me with my focus on moving toward unity. Notice the second indicator or some, a second inspiration toward unity is God's comfort. Notice verse 1 again. Since any consolation of love. This is a very similar word to encouragement. It also has a, um, a preposition that is there that means to come alongside. And so, so God comes alongside of me and he's able to comfort me. This, that's what the word consolation means. But what kind of comfort does he give? Notice it's the comfort of love. Now Paul is not talking about Somebody in the Philippian church coming next to that person and giving them a comfort of love or consolation of love. He's not talking about us doing that in the church. He's talking about God has done that. It's something that's happened in the past. It's the work of God that has come next to me and he loves me unconditionally. And if he loves me unconditionally, that ought to inspire me to love you un unconditionally. That we work together in expressing that love. So the fact that God has reached down and loved us should inspire us to be united. What's a third inspiration? He says, if any or since any fellowship of the spirits. That means that there's a mutual interest and in common activities in the things of God where an individual and the Holy Spirit are joint participants. Now, he's already used that word earlier in chapter 1, and that's what he's talking about when he uses this idea of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, is that we're joint participant. Now, here's the question. If every person, let's just take our church, if every person in this room who claims to know Christ, that means that the Holy Spirit is in you. If the Holy Spirit is in you and the Holy Spirit is in me, why is it that there are times that the church is not united? We all have the same spirit. It's because we're not controlled by the Spirit of God. It's one thing to say, I have the Spirit. It's a whole other thing to say, I'm controlled by the Spirit. What's Paul saying in Ephesians 5? Don't be drunk with wine, 
but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled there means they're empty and they need more of the Spirit. It means you have the Spirit. It means to be controlled by the Spirit. It was a word that was used when they put a bit in a horse's mouth and controlled the horse. That's the word that's used here. So I'm this wild, untamed animal without the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God comes in and puts its bit in my mouth. And it controls, it gives direction to the horse. It gives direction to my life. All right? So we're being controlled by the Spirit. We're joint participants. A.W. Tozer said this. It's a great illustration. He said, if I have 100 pianos in the room, and I tune all 100 pianos to a tuning fork, automatically, all 100 pianos are tuned to each other. Why is that? Because they're not tuned to one another. I'm trying to be kind to you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to love you. I'm trying to do this. I, 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 I. He says, no, that individual piano is tuned to an outside source that is absolute. It is perfect. And your life and my life, we're not tuned to each other. We'll be a mess. If you're, if you're tuned to me or I'm tuned to you, it's not going to work. But all of us, our piano, our life is tuned to a perfect, absolute standard, a tuner, Jesus Christ. And when that happens, we're automatically in tune with each other. So the question is, has your life been tuned by the Holy Spirit? Every day, it has to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. So we're all one. So Paul says, that ought to inspire us to know that my life has been tuned by the Holy Spirit. Your life has been in tune by the Holy Spirit. You're being controlled by the Spirit. I'm being controlled by the Spirit. That ought to motivate us and inspire us to move toward unity with each other. So he gives us this idea, fourth, of inspiring toward unity through God's grace. Notice, if or since there is affection and mercy. The word affection, we've looked at it before already, and it means bowels. This word was used to describe the inner person, and it meant where the emotions are seated deep within us. And he says God has this deep, deep love for us. Again, he's not talking about the love that the Philippians have toward one another, it's the love that God has for us, and He's shown, He's manifested that love, that affection toward us with His mercy. Now, where do we see that? On the cross. If you want to know, if you want to know what God thinks about you and how He feels about you, you just look at the cross. And you see His affection and His mercy. He acted out on that affection. That's what mercy does. In a courtroom, a judge shows mercy. The act of the judge has demonstrated the way he feels about your certain situation. And so our high judge has shown his love, his affection toward us by the cross. And when we have that common grace, that ought to inspire us toward unity. When I think of God's encouragement, God's comfort, God's fellowship and God's grace, that should inspire me and that should inspire you to set aside our preference about where the bench sits on the platform. And that we come together to be unified because of the prior work of God in our life. All right? So that's the inspiration for unity. Notice, secondly, the indicator of unity. How do I know? How do you know? That we are unified. Notice what he says. First of all, he introduces the idea with this uh, command, fulfill my joy. Bring to completion what has already begun. Now, what does he mean by that? He's in prison. They have created joy uh, in him, in his life, because of the way they have loved him. They've supported him. He's under house arrest. He has to pay for his own rent, remember. Uh, we, we learned that in Acts chapter uh, 27 and 28. Where he has to pay for his own rent. He's under house arrest. People can come and go. He's chained to a soldier. Uh, but this church has helped support him to pay 
so that he can have that place to live while he's waiting to appeal before Caesar, before Nero. And so he, he's expressing that love. Now, make my joy complete. Fulfill it even more by loving each other in the congregation. You see, his focus is not on his own personal joy. He's more concerned about the health of the church. That's what's going to create joy for him is what's going on in the body of Christ. Can I be honest? You want to make my joy complete? Well, that's, that happens when a church is unified, when a church is together. Now, I have a lot of joy in my heart as your pastor, as I'll share in just a moment. So he says there is this joy. Now, the four indicators of unity are this. Number one, he says, thinking the same way. Paul's encouraging a single mindset among the Philippian church. It's not just something that is intellectual. It's not a set of facts to know, but it is intentional. It's an act of the will that you're thinking this way. It, it's a common understanding and agreement that you have that everyone should be like-minded. It doesn't mean that I have differences of opinion, uh, uh, anything like that. It's not conformity. There's diversity but unity that is created when we're like-minded. Now, he'll explain the kind of mind that he's talking about in the following verses. What is it? The mind of Christ. It's one of the early church hymns in the New Testament that we see. And the verse 5 and following is about the mind of Christ. What Christ has done. Have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself, took on the form of a servant, etc. And then he humbles it by going to the cross. So that's the mind that we're going to talk about next Sunday. So he, 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 he says, this is the way you need to be thinking. And if you're thinking that way, then that shows unity. If everybody's thinking the same way. Secondly, he says, another indicator is having the same love. The Philippians are to have the same love toward one another. Why? Because he's, God has expressed his love toward each other the same way. God doesn't love you differently from me. He loves you the same way he loves me, and he loves me the same way he loves you. There's no difference. We're all sinners, and we all need to be saved. We're all standing at the foot of the cross, regardless of what sin we've committed. Any sin has separated us from a holy God, and the only way that we can have a relationship with God is by what Jesus did on the cross when he shed his blood for us. That's where we all stand. And so he says that we have this same love toward one another because of this love that he has for us. Again, it's not simply an emotion of love, but it's a love that is an act of the will. It is intentional. Love is active. It's not passive. It's more than saying, I love you. It means I'm living that out in my faith. So when we have the same love for one another... Then it shows a sign of unity. What did Jesus say in John 17? They will know that you are my disciples by the way in which you love one another. Talk to the believers. How we love one another is a sign out there that we are one. Notice he says another indicator that a church is one is sharing the same feelings. That means we are one souled, literally. It's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. It means acting selflessly toward one another. Not self-centered, but God-centered and other-centered. And when that happens, that produces harmony in the church. It's an indicator. Focusing on one goal is another indicator. What's the goal? The goal, listen, of every single church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. He, say, he, 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 he says that's, that's what we ought to be doing. What does that mean? What's the goal of this church? Now, everybody has to be on the same page in order for there to be unity. It means our purpose as a church, our purpose as individuals, who claim to know Christ, is to lead people to saving faith in Jesus Christ, to disciple them, help them grow and mature in their faith, so that they are sharing the gospel with somebody else, and they're investing in their life and helping them grow and mature in such a way that now they are able to teach somebody else, and the cycle continues. That's the process of multiplication. 
Again, remember what Paul told Timothy, a young pastor, 2 Timothy 2, 2. The things that you've heard from me, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, as I said last Sunday, I went into more detail about this. This is what it's all about. Everything that we do here is about what happened just a few minutes ago when Justin Cummings got baptized, who just finished 13 years of walking around dirt roads in Iraq and Afghanistan finding bombs to save the lives of our troops. Now try that for a job for 13 years. And God has saved him by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that's what it's all about. Do you know that there are about 45, 50,000 Southern Baptist churches Last year and almost every year, a roughly five to 6,000 of those churches will never baptize one person in a year. And almost every Sunday, we are seeing somebody coming to faith in Jesus Christ, either in church or out there or on Tuesday night and celebrate recovery or through other ministries of our church. Almost every Sunday, we're baptizing somebody who's come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now, you look around and you find how many churches are actually experiencing that. Not many. And the reason why not many are doing that is they don't have the same goal. You have one goal, he says. Not five or six goals, but one goal. And the whole context of chapter 1, he uses the word gospel six times, is about that. That's what we ought to be doing. And when we have that one goal, that's an indicator that a church is unified. I thank God. Our church is not perfect. But I thank God that I think we understand that. Here's how we say it. Inviting all people to become committed followers of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. Our goal is to create an inviting environment so that when they come, they feel welcomed and loved. And they can experience Christ. And then we invite them to come. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I firmly believe that a person without Christ who's invited and starts coming to that church, to this church, over time, and not a very long time, is going to hear the gospel, going to see it operating because of the love that we have for one another, and we're going to sing our hearts out to God because of it, like we did today. We're happy about what God has done in us. And they're going to experience that, and then God is going to touch their heart and draw them to himself because the gospel is the priority of this church. I firmly believe that. And, and when that happens, it's a great encouragement. I got an email last night. I'm going to share it next Sunday because I want more people here. It's a holiday weekend. So I'm, I'm being fleshly right there. I admit it, okay? But I'm going to read it next Sunday. An email I got last night of a family who visited our church in February. Phenomenal experience, they said of how they got to this church, of what happened when they drove onto the parking lot and when they walked in the foyer and what happened in here and what's happened since then. I, I tell you, I'm so proud of this church. I, I had nothing to do with it. You'll, you'll laugh about it next Sunday because I had nothing to do with it. Of what, what God is doing. You see, when a church is unified, there's great power. There's a great force when all the fingers on the hand are organized into one unit, it's a positive force that cannot be stopped. It's a magnet. It's the love of Christ. And so that's what Paul is saying. That's the sign. Those are the indicators of a church that is unified. Now notice finally, what happens when you're not unified? How do you get back to a church that is unified? Well, he says this, the instruction for unity. He gives us five ways to achieve that. I'll go through them quickly. Verse 3, notice he says, do nothing out of rivalry. That could be translated selfish ambition or self-seeking or selfishness. Philippi had a stratified culture, as most of the Roman Empire did. You had all these different levels of people, and it created uh, a strata. It created divisions in the culture. You, and, and, and so there, was a, there wasn't a sense of unity in the culture, and it affected the church. You had these different stratifications in the church. And, and it was demonstrated by this idea of do nothing out of rivalry. When you think of the word rivalry, it means that there are competing forces against one another. And so what would happen is parties would develop within a church. In the culture we see in America, we have different political parties. 
who have different philosophical ideas that create rivalry toward one another. And you begin to lose your focus as a nation when that happens. God help us. And it can happen in a church that divisions, pockets of division and rivalry, contention, four different services because of a piano bench. It seems ridiculous. But that's how the devil operates. He said, do nothing out of rivalry. Out of anything that is selfish in nature. Leads to the next one, verse 3. Do nothing out of conceit. Literally, it means empty glory. Your translation may say vain glory. What does that mean? A person has an exaggerated view of himself. He thinks more of himself than he really is. Have you ever met somebody like that? They're always talking about themselves. Always talking about what they've done. They don't ask you any questions. You wrote, they're the one having to ask all the questions in a conversation. And they have this high view of themselves. And he says, don't think like that. He said, you've got to stop thinking like that if you're going to be unified. If everybody has an exaggerated view of himself in a church, what's going to happen? Disunity. It, it, it's going to dissolve. It's going to fracture and splinter off into all these different factions. Three. Verse 3, in humility, consider others as more important than yourself. It could be translated, have humility of mind. Being on the same page, having one goal, as we stated earlier. The Greeks, when they used this word, it was never used in a positive way. They would use this word to speak of a slave who was low-born. That's how that word would be translated. He was low-born. Very negative connotation when this word humility was used. Uh, it was not a virtue. The Jews, when they used this word in the Old Testament, when God used this word in the Old Testament, then uh, we see that it, it, was, it states a lowly person or a humble person. And, and God comes to help the lowly and the humble. All right. So the culture would still see them uh, in a negative way, but God's people begin to see them in a positive light. Paul shows that humility is a positive virtue and it's demonstrated most fully in Jesus Christ and the way in which he lived and ultimately the cross. If you want to see humility, you look at the cross. Uh, today, the way I like to think of the word humility uh, is a definition that I heard years ago. Humility is knowing who you are, knowing who God is, and not getting the two mixed up. I've said this often, right? And that's our problem. We think we're God. Humility says, no, I'm not. There's only one God. I'm not on the throne of my heart. He is. Christ chose to humble himself. That's what he, Paul says we need to do. That's how you get back to unity in the body of Christ. Everybody humbles himself. Then, notice he says, number four, everyone should look out not only for his own interest. Now, that's interesting. He says, you have personal interests, and pay attention to that. He may have been speaking toward aestheticism, that you have personal uh, uh, interest in yourself physically. Take care of yourself. I would say that you need to take care of yourself spiritually, and mentally, emotionally, physically. That's not bad. You need to pay attention to what's going on with you. But he says there's more to that. You pay attention. Here's the way. You pay attention to yourself, but you don't promote yourself. You know people who promote themselves? You don't, you, you pay attention to yourself, but don't promote yourself. All right? Then finally he says, look out also for the interest of others. Unity is created when I care about your interests, not my own interests. And that should be our focus. So here it is. Humility plus service see now you can see the full picture of what Paul is saying humility plus service equals unity now let's bring it home for just a moment married couples are you unified what's the formula for unity in your marriage humility plus service toward your spouse equals humility pride Self-centeredness equals disunity in the marriage, right? How about work? 
You want unity at work? You want everybody on the same page? Humility plus service equals unity. You're going to have a successful business. Pride plus self-centeredness is going to create disunity in your business. It ain't going to work. So God gives you a formula today that's not just for the church, but it's what's happening at home and it's what's happening where you work. Friendships. You want to have friends. How many times have I heard, I don't have any friends. Humility plus service equals unity. When I humble myself, it's not about me, and I start serving others. Well, Pastor, I'm doing that, but it hadn't come back to me. You just keep doing it. You keep on going. And if you keep doing it the right way, God will give you the joy of unity. The joy of marriage, the joy of work, the joy of friendships, and listen, joy in the body of Christ. Now, I want to say again, as I said last Sunday, I'm so thankful because you create great joy for me. And the way you do what you do and how we love one another, we don't do that perfectly. I know that. But I've been in churches. I hear about churches recently where it's blowing up. And it's over preferences. It's not over doctrinal issues. But here Paul helps us understand. And now next week, boy, don't miss next week. Because he says, here's the key to it all. Jesus Christ. There might be somebody here today who would say, Pastor, to really be honest, I'm not, I'm not one with God. I don't feel like there's unity between me and God. Paul makes it clear in Romans. That we're either at war with God or we're at peace with God. We're an enemy of God or a friend of God. There's no middle ground. Positionally, that's where we are. And he said, all that can be reconciled through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's when I humble myself to what God has done for me. And I acknowledge that. And I just don't believe a set of facts about the work of Christ, what he did on the cross... But then I turn from my way, my sin, and I turn to Christ, and I go His way. And I begin a journey of faith. And I experience that oneness with God. For some of you today, that's what you need. You need to be one with God. And there's only one way that can happen, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. Secondly, there are some here today, many who say, I know the Lord. But there's, there's discontent. There's disunity. It could be with somebody in the church. It could be at home. It could be at work or a friendship or whatever. Now, I've given you the formula. And you know, you know where that place is that you need to change. And you need to humble yourself before the Lord. That means I admit that I'm wrong. I admit that I don't have all the answers. I admit that you're God and I'm not. And I'm going to let you be on the throne of my life. And I'm going to start serving others. I'm going to consider their interest as more important than mine. That's hard to do, isn't it? You see, we can't do that in the flesh. We need the power of God in us to make that happen. So what does that mean? I need to be controlled by the Spirit. I need to let the Spirit of God put His big bridle in my life and begin to steer, control me. So I don't get out of control in what I say or what I do. And then there's unity, right? Some God may be leading to become part of our church family. Again, not a perfect church, but I believe we are a unified church in our goal and our purpose and the way we love one another and help one another. And we would love for you to be a part of what God is doing here. Because, listen, unity advances the gospel of Jesus Christ. Disunity thwarts and hinders the gospel of Christ. If that's our goal, unity is paramount. Because unity creates an opportunity for us to preach the gospel, to live out the gospel, and to see it work. But we'd love for you to be a part of that here at Linwood. Others may just need to come and pray. You need to talk to somebody. We're prepared to help you. Even if you don't know what to say or do, you come and we'll help you. Father, thank you for the power of your word. And the power of your spirit that bears witness to your word in our hearts. 
And help these now who need to make commitments to you, who need to respond to the pull of their heart by your Spirit. And Lord, I know what the enemy is doing. He, he's trying to keep us from humbling ourselves. He's trying to convince us, you don't need to do that. You don't need to say you're sorry. You don't need to try to correct that. Just let it go and move on. But that doesn't solve the problem. So Lord Jesus, I pray you'll get the enemy out of the way. Help these not to listen to his lies, but respond to the leading of your spirit now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's quietly stand while we sing this next song and continue our worship. I'll be here at the front to help you. And so while we sing as God speaks, you come right now. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing, holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory, holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment there's still time for you to come if God is leading you to do that or maybe you just need a quiet moment with the Lord and share your heart with him asking him to help you and let him minister his grace to you right now
Father, thank you for just being here this morning. We sense your presence. Thank you for ministering to our hearts, helping us at the point of our need. Thank you that we have a God like you who encourages us, who inspires us uh, to move toward unity in relationships in the body of Christ. Because that's how the world really sees who you are in us. And so, God, I pray that you help all of us today as we respond to the teaching of your word, that it will transform us into the likeness of Christ, that we will indeed have his mind above all else that will be for our good, that will be for your glory, that will impact the world for the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. We're going to continue our worship as we give to the Lord our tithes and our offerings. Our men will come now as they do. I want to thank those who are guests today. And if you filled out a Connect card earlier, you'll want to place that card in the offering plate as your gift to us now. And uh, again, we really appreciate you coming to worship with us. For members, thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord, especially during these summer months. We've got a lot of activities going on with our kids. And uh, all of that is used to help advance the gospel of Christ here and around the world. But let's prepare our hearts as we give to the Lord now. Mike, you come and lead us, please, sir. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for this local church. I'm grateful that you've placed our family here. Lord, we give you all the praise and glory for the unity that exists among this church family. Lord, I pray that our, our focus, that our vision would always be on making disciples. Lord, may it never be on something like a, a piano bench. Lord, as we give back to you now with uh, these tithes and offerings, Lord, we pray that they would be used to make disciples here and around the world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Great encouragement to know that God is always with us. Amen. Uh, this afternoon, we don't have any activities or any service this evening. Hope you'll have an enjoyable time with family and friends. And uh, I want to say thanks to Gretchen. Gretchen for filling in. New member of our church, filling in for Billy. Thank you, Gretchen. Appreciate it very much. For those of your guests, if I've not had the opportunity to meet you personally out in the foyer, I'd love to do so after the service. And I pray that God will empower to you to live a life that reflects the love of Christ to others this week. God bless you. You're dismissed.